Hey, in times of moral uncertainty and uh, times of the moral ambiguity, it is imperative for the church to draw a clear line in the sand as it relates to biblical truth and biblical values. That's exactly what Bonhoeffer did in his day. It was called the Barman Declaration. It was an opportunity for the church to stand up and be the church. And unfortunately, uh, we had 3,000 folks who did stand up for righteousness and the confessing church. We had 3,000 more that fully aligned with Hitler's Third Reich. And we had a squishy middle of 12,000 pastors who chose to remain silent, sit on the sidelines, and just kind of watch and see what happened. The question that Metaxas asks us today is what would history look like if those 12,000 pastors would have chosen to act with clarity and courage and get in the game? We're facing the same challenges today in the church uh, in America with, with the pulpits and we're encouraging pastors not to make the same mistakes. You're not going to want to miss this podcast. Hey, welcome to the Ron Johnson Discipleship Podcast. <laughs> Where you never know what's going to come out of these minds right yeah. here until it happens. So yeah, we, you got to watch the, 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 the <laughs> B-roll, the, uh, the outtakes, yeah. <laughs> see what's yeah. really happening. Matthew, we need to come out with a blooper reel or yeah. something that we can, uh, I'm sure. That will that, definitely get us banned on YouTube. That's going to go viral. <laughs> No, we're glad you're here with us, and uh, we're, we're in a deep dive of a wonderful book called Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas, and um, if you haven't picked up a copy, I encourage you to do so. It is a prophetic word to the church today, and especially to pastors today, and while this podcast is not dedicated exclusively to pastors, uh, we sure hope that uh, pastors will listen in, and, uh, and then we can build a like-minded movement. You know, we're talking about what happened during... Uh, uh, Bonhoeffer's uh, uh, leadership in Nazi Germany and trying to learn some lessons from history and not make the same mistakes. And so we're talking uh, today about a chapter that's simply entitled 12,000 Pastors, kind of an intriguing, yeah. intriguing uh, uh, title. But where we left off last podcast, we were talking about uh, a message uh, that that Bonhoeffer delivered called The Church and the Jewish Question. And I encourage you to go check out our previous podcast. We go into depth on that. But basically, Hitler had overplayed his cards a little bit, and uh, you began to see the real Hitler coming out and his, his genuine intentions uh, because he began a kind of a cancel culture movement against anybody with Jewish blood. It started off by simply being not allowed to hold public office, uh, and then it spilled over into the marketplace, uh, not doing business with uh, Jewish businesses, uh, and basically, this forced, you know, the members of the true church, people that actually love Christ and read the Bible and, and hold the Bible in high regard, they had to make a decision, and, and Bonhoeffer really drew the, the line in the sand. Because basically what he said was, and it was pretty straightforward, you cannot be a true church of Jesus Christ and allow your Jewish brothers or any person on planet Earth, for that matter, to be singled out and persecuted. In fact, he said it is our obligation as true Christians to be able to share the gospel with everybody. And if all of a sudden the government says, well, these people are untouchable or canceled and you're not allowed to interact with them or have them in your church or, or minister to them, uh, then that is an incredible act of government overreach. And at that point, the line has to be drawn. And so here's this young pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's making some pretty radical and clear-cut and bold statements and drawing a very clear line in the sand and, and expecting... The church to say amen and to line up, <clears throat> and what he found out was just the opposite. Right, and it's interesting because these lines he drew are not like crazy theological overreaches. Okay, yeah, they're obvious conclusions from the Bible, but and, and many of the pastors who probably did not sign this will agree. So the issue is not necessary theology, but much deeper issues, and well, we find yeah. parallels today, right? You bring out a great point right there because <laughs> because the the issue is not do you believe that you know J Jesus is the Christ, the yeah. Son of the Living God? <laughs> the issue is what are you willing to do to stand for that belief? Yeah, it's, That's it's, a real it's one issue. thing to hold the belief in the 
in the comfort of your own congregation right. or in the comfort of your own yeah, conscience. You know I agree with this. Come on, buddy. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah, need to yeah, sign yeah. this. I'm good, right? I'm just not sure that that's the approach. And, and yeah. you know, he highlights there was a whole bunch of the folks that were saying, let's give this guy, Adolf Hitler, the benefit of the doubt. Let, let's work with him. Let, let's give him some time. We don't really know. You know, we've heard him talk r- during his campaigning, and he said some pretty good things about Christianity and Jesus and the church. And so— you know, let, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, who are we to go against the state? We don't want to be enemies of the state. Um, let, let's go. Let's get along and go along, and uh, and you know, and and let's just see how this thing's going to play out. I mean, and that was the approach that most of the church, unfortunately, most of the leadership in the church was taking at the yeah. time. And uh, and it proved obviously to be to be tragic. Pastors could never see themselves as political enemies of the state any more than today. You have a, a large group of pastors who. Again, simply roll over under the banner of Romans 13 and, and never want to do anything that would look like uh, civil disobedience or pushing back against the state power. So this was tremendously frustrating for Bonhoeffer because he knew that unless the German church leaders clearly saw the urgency of what was happening and acted with even greater urgency, all would be lost. And, and I want to just pause right here, a little, little side comment. Um, you know, our podcast is dedicated to the, the forming of a biblically-centered Christian worldview and, and really to articulating that when Jesus is Lord over all of life, life is lived to the fullest. Mm-hmm. In other words, our, we're unashamedly saying every week, our worldview is the best. Prove, prove us otherwise. And one of the things I've often said about a, a Christian worldview is it gives you the ability to see faster and see farther. And what I mean by that is, you know, we say this over and over again, ideas have consequences. If you understand certain ideas, you can uh, for understand that, okay, this idea is incompatible with this worldview. Right. And that's what that's what uh, Bonhoeffer was doing. He said, wait a minute. And this is what even the Nazi uh, officials understood. Um, Nazi socialism was completely incompatible with biblical Christianity. Bonhoeffer understood that. And some of the greatest enemies of the gospel on Hitler's side that hated Christ and hated the church, they understood they were incompatible. That's because they understood their worldview. Mm-hmm. Now, we're dealing with this situation over and over again today. We, we deal with it on marriage issue, on life issue. You know, for instance, you know, when, when, when uh, somebody says, well, we're, we're going to find a good compromise on, on the abortion issue. It's somebody that's, that's a politician. They're not operating from a Christian worldview perspective because there's, you cannot have a compromise when you start from two diametrically opposed presuppositions. Mm-hmm. They don't go together. Uh, I had a meeting with a former governor of Indiana, and we tried to say, Governor, why are you caving in on uh, on people who do not share your values at all and actually hate your Christianity? Why are you trying to find compromise with these people, undermine your base, and you're never going to please these people anyway? In other words, it's not that we don't that we can't treat you with decency and respect, but there is no coming together of your worldview with our worldview. Mm-hmm. If you believe a marriage is between a man and a woman, then how in the world are you ever going to find a compromising position with the LGBT community on that issue that's promoting same-sex uh, relationships, same-sex marriages? Uh, it, it, there's no compromise there. One, one worldview says this is wrong, and the other worldview says this is ab- absolutely should be celebrated. And so Bonhoeffer was able to go, wait a minute, guys, if the Nazis can attack the Jews— and, and ultimately lead to the extermination of the Jews. What will stop them from doing that with any other group they right. deem unfit? You know, they did it with, with those who were the handicapped. Um, uh, you know, Hitler viewed them as people who just were consumers. They just were food eaters, but they contributed nothing. And so he euthanized all kinds of people that just had physical or mental handicaps. So in other words, if, if the state takes that kind of power over one group of people, What's going to stop them from trampling the rights of everybody? Um, that's just a great worldview perspective. And, you know, even in our own church here, <clears throat> back in the day when hate crimes were becoming a thing, I was trying to loudly trumpet from our pulpit that this should be of grave concern to all of us because this is a, a, an overt trampling of religious liberty. And now that that horse is so far out of the stall. Right. Uh, but it didn't take a rocket scientist two decades ago to see, like, where we're at today. 
Well, I will say in Indiana, at least, it's been buffered. And probably because of the pastors speaking up about that issue, you know, affecting our legislature. And we're a conservative state, and, right. we, and for the most part, we have uh, elected officials who share a w- biblical worldview, or at least are sensitive to a biblical Well, I remember worldview. when you did a um, news interview about hate crime legislation, right? Oh, yeah, many and of them. So, I mean, I believe those voices from pastors like yourself have made a difference with the legislature, because who are the ones who are their constituents, are people who attend these churches? So those guys are listening to those voices. My point is those, when you did those interviews, when you talk about those issues, they have impact, you know. We might not have those direct impact, but but I mean, right now in Indiana, that largely is not a major issue, probably because well, of those interviews. But, but I share mm-hmm. I share Bonhoeffer's frustration because mm-hmm. he is seeing that you're at a catalytic moment. Sure, it's a time to come together. I, this was a little bit before my time. I was still young, but but when the Operation Rescue movement was happening, basically, and this is what Pastor Keith Tusi and some other national leaders took part in. Basically, this was their contention: if the church would simply stand up and show up at peacefully mm-hmm. at these abortion Holocaust centers, right, and say enough is enough. There's not enough prisons in America to hold the church. In other words, it would have thrown a wrench in the entire system, and they would have had to have been forced to deal with the issue. But you had good people saying, well, I'm not sure that's the way to go. I'm not sure that's the right approach. Even though you were simply saying, we will not sit around and tolerate the slaughter of the innocents in our backyard. So if the church would have mobilized at that moment, we probably would have had a completely different abortion scenario. When we saw uh, life trampled in Indiana, we saw religious liberty, we saw the Soji stuff, um, that was a catalytic moment. So what we're saying was, hey, if the church would just simply stand up on these issues, stand up and show up. And we did. Well, in, we, in, in but, terms of the, in terms of the, at, at least in Indiana, at least. With well, the so- well, so- no, I would say no. I would say we didn't because how many major churches, mega churches? Well, I'm saying our church did. <laughs> yeah, well, our church did. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, I, I spent time running right. around the entire state. Mm-hmm. Uh, trying to cast a vision for the uh, Indiana Pastors Alliance, mm-hmm. simply to say, pastors, let's stand on these issues. These are right. biblical issues. And if all of us stand and we represent right. hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers, right. that's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, and I'm saying when maybe not all the church, but some church did show up at the state house. Oh, yeah. Our voices were heard, Absolutely. and that wasn't the whole church. Imagine if all the church stood, you know. So I, my, I guess my point I'm trying to make is this does matter. These voices do matter. Even when when our church and, and just a few other church show up at the state house, what was it, yeah. 10 years we ago might, or so? Yeah. Yep. I mean, well, we had probably 1,500 people that showed up during a day. Many of them had to take off you know, yeah. work. Um, and uh, and again, that sh- that just showed you a small microcosm of what could happen. And we halt that that movement of the soldier laws, I believe. That was, that yep. was yeah. So yep. and we made an impact. Imagine if more churches show, the larger churches show up. Right. Absolutely. And and that's the vision. And and, and it's not that hard. I mean, okay, we're we're digressing here. Maybe we have to do fourteen <laughs> podcasts on this one topic. But um, but even okay, what is so hard about writing a letter? simply saying to some employer, please honor the conscience uh, rights and conscience protections right. guaranteed in our, our system of government in America, historically, throughout the, from the foundation of our country. Yeah. Please protect the religious liberty views of your people. If they don't feel comfortable getting a shot, then please respect that. Don't make it a matter of employment or punishment or fine them. I mean... Pastors everywhere should have been writing letters. This is not a rocket science. This is like what we do. We are about religious liberty. We are about standing for the rights of conscience. This is the foundation of worship. Yeah. And we had we had people saying, well, we're going to consult our attorneys. Why do you consult an attorney over something as, as benign and simple as this? This is not hard. Or we're going to consult our, our insurance company. Why does the insurance company, <laughs> who cares what your insurance company says about what, what is so radical? What is so controversial? What is so threatening uh, to a pastor about standing up for somebody's rights of conscience. Like, this is our bread and butter. This is what we do. This is our job description. And if we're not going to do it, who is going to do it? And yet, 
That's why we, that's why we had all these COVID babies, like I shared Sunday. COVID babies. <laughs> COVID babies. All these people that were birthed as living stoners that came out of COVID, and, and it's because they couldn't get any support. They were losing their jobs, and when they turn to their churches and they turn to their pastors for support, nothing. Yeah. And, and it's that's frustrating because we're dealing with the same passive. Uh, church that, that Bonhoeffer was dealing with. Right. No, nothing's really changed. Uh, so here, a little history here. As 1933 wore on, the main battle lines in the German church itself were shown to lie between the devotedly pro-Nazi Deutsch Christians uh, who zealously wished to help Hitler form and oversee a national Reich church. That was one side. On the other side um, came to be known what was called the Confessing Church. Now, the Confessing Church would be what we would call Bible-believing, you know, evangelicals, uh, you know, the people that are putting their faith out on the line and connecting the dots, standing up for truth in the public arena. Yeah. Those were those were the two the two battle lines that were formed, and we uh, Bonhoeffer gets in, or I'm sorry, Metaxas covers a lot of this in his um, biography on Bonhoeffer, and we don't have time to go into the the detail here, but this is what was so smart about Hitler was he was the ultimate um, uh, politician. Mm-hmm. He says one thing to satisfy certain groups, while privately. And hidden rooms and co- private conversations absolutely shares what he really believes about the church. And and I want to pull out some quotes here. Uh, and this, if you're a pastor and you're listening, this should tick you off. Um, it, it, you know, I, I would like to say this. If nothing ticks us off uh, in life and gets us to be activated, maybe it should be the pathetic view that, that ungodly politicians have this about This is how they really think yeah, of you. This is how they really think of you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm quoting Adolf Hitler right here. Um, he says, uh, actually, let me, let me read the first quote from here from the book, page 165, if you guys have this book. Um, but this is Hitler's direct views about pastors. All right. He says, it's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice <laughs> for the fatherland as the highest good? Or the Mohammedan, talking about Muslims. The Mohammedan religion, too, would have been more compatible to us than Christianity. Why did it have to be Christianity with its meekness and flabbiness? So (laughs) Hitler viewed meekness as weakness and flabbiness. In other words, these Christians are lazy. They have no courage. They don't stand for what they believe. And so here's a a quote from Adolf Hitler. He says, you can do, this this is what he thinks of pastors. You can do anything you want with them. They will submit. They are insignificant little people, submissive as dogs, and they sweat with embarrassment when you talk to them. Um, he said, "He said pastors will do anything you want them to do as long as you um, basically don't threaten to take away their puny little economic stipend that they got from the state. Mm -hmm. So as long as money was coming in and everything was comfortable, uh, they they would do anything that you want. Wow. What an insulting... I mean, when you think about the pulpit of the revolution time, or you think about the prophetic voices like John the Baptist, right, Um, in Bible times... Um, people that would stand for truth and risk their lives. And even as Bonhoeffer said, uh, when you think of, of L- Martin Luther himself, the founder of Lutheranism, the Luther- Lutheran church, yeah. his willingness to put it all on the line for truth. And then Hitler says, these guys are pathetic, lazy little dogs. They sweat when they're in my presence. They'll submit to anything, just, just threaten to take away their, their pay, which is paltry anyway, uh, and they'll cave. It's not much has changed. Wow. Uh, we're not getting state-funded churches, but but how many pastors, they won't say what needs to be said because they're afraid a couple tithers will walk out the door and it's going to hurt their bottom line. I mean, we're still dealing with the same issues in the church today that, that they have been dealing with all throughout human history. So Hitler says one thing in public, oh, we love the church, we're, you know, we love Christ, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then behind closed doors, he's surrounded himself with people who are God haters. I mean, Himmler and some of these people wanted, their approach was different. They were going to, wanted to go straight after the church, crush the church. Uh, 
Hitler understood that's probably not the best political means. Let's eventually get there, but let's take our time. Let's say one thing in public, do another thing in private. Mm-hmm. And so, for instance, I think back some of some of the leadership that we've had. Um, I, I remember Barack Obama when he he ran almost like a conservative on the social issue. He was for biblical marriage and and on and on and on. Uh, Bill Clinton wanted to make abortion rare. Uh, uh, exceptional, right? And then when they get into power, all of a sudden everything flip-flops, and we find them pushing an agenda that is decisively anti-Christian. Um, and if they're going to do that, again, say one thing in public and do another thing in private, you know that the people they've surrounded themselves with have a hatred for the gospel and a hatred for anything that comes in the way of their agenda. Uh, that's what happened with Hitler. He said, look, you, you Christians do what you want, uh, as long, he talked about positive Christianity, which meant simply the church can believe whatever it wants as long as you're not uh, being so, uh, subversive mm. to the Nazi agenda. So in other words, yeah, just stay out of our way and, and be nice and preach Jesus. But as soon as Jesus comes in conflict with Nazism or with progressivism or liberalism um, or whatever the the vision political vision is, then you're going to be put back in your place. Yeah. And we're seeing that today. We're seeing that all over the world today. Whenever secularism comes in conflict with the scriptures, secularism's goal is always to crush whatever's in its way. Um, and so, you know, it's no surprise. Who is, who is, who is Hitler's uh, favorite author? Nietzsche, um, who simply believed in the will to power. That was, that was, that was the highest virtue, power. And, uh, and he talked about his Superman, or uh, Ubermensch, uh, this man that would rise up uh, and um, be a cruel and ruthless champion of unbridled power. And so it's interesting, Bonhoeffer, uh, in the book Bonhoeffer, says that uh, Nietzsche was Hitler's John the Baptist. He was preparing the way because Hitler saw himself as the fulfillment of that Superman. Yeah. He was going to be the one who was going to crush uh, for the sake of, of Germany and for the sake of German glory, et cetera, et cetera, he was going to crush anybody that came in his path, and that's exactly what he ended up doing. And so the church was free as long as it didn't interfere with the plans of the state. And for Hitler, allegiance to God was actually allegiance to the state. But there were about three major voices that we talk about, Bonhoeffer and Martin Niemöller and Karl Barth, who drew the line in the sand, Uh, And they realized that if the Nazis succeeded in creating a Reich church that was subservient to Hitler, the church in Germany would effectively be dead. And I wanted to read some of the uh, talking points here of what they were promoting for the Reich church, because some of these things are strangely similar today, all right? So the national, national church demands immediate cessation of the publishing and dissemination of the Bible in Germany. So what the first thing that these folks do is they either get rid of the Bible or rewrite the Bible. <laughs> right. And we've seen that in totalitarian countries. Second thing, the national church declares that to it and therefore to the German nation, it has been decided that the Führer's Mein Kampf is the greatest of all documents. It not only contains the greatest, but it embodies the purest and truest ethics for the present and future of our nation. So now we're, they're replacing the scripture with Hitler's book as the high watermark of morality and ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it, it, people in our culture today are very quick to uh, condemn the Bible and, and up, uphold a, a number of other uh, ethical views higher than the Scripture. The national church will clear away from uh, its altars all crucifixes, Bibles, and pictures of saints. So now we're saying that in the church itself, no, no uh, symbols of the cross— no pictures of, of saints to be uh, uh, prayed to or supported, not that we're supporting praying to saints, but uh, honored, right. uh, revered. All right. Um, next, on the altars, there must be nothing but Mein Kampf to the German nation and therefore to God, the most sacred book, and to the left of the altar, a sword. So now you're putting Hitler's book on the altars in church next to a sword and removing the scriptures. And then lastly here, on the day of its foundation, the Christian cross must be removed from all churches, cathedrals, and chapels, and it must be superseded by the only unconquerable symbol, the swastika. So this is what's coming with a national church. It's really a German church. 
It's really a Nazified church, and it's really not a church at all. It's not church at all. It's been, it's been yeah. completely replaced with uh, with so, Nazi ideas. It's a religious yeah. sect of Nazi. Absolutely. So it's no it's synonym, church. The church is synonymous with, with Nazism. And what's crazy is you look in some of these books. This is a great book. I also want to recommend to everybody, uh, When a Nation Forgets God by uh, Erwin Lutzer. Amazing book. Uh, he has actual pictures of... Uh, of altars in Germany, big big Nazi flags draped. Um, uh, parents, when they're ded- dedicating their children, they're not dedicating their children to the Lord. They're baptizing their children into basically Nazism. Yeah. Uh, they're becoming uh, members of the state, uh, uh, state family, whatever you know. So, uh, yeah, and you see the similar pattern during um, the Cultural Revolution in China. Right. You know, it's, it's Mao. The Mao, Mao's little red book becomes yep. replaced every kind of religion out there. It becomes the new religion. Yeah, it is the new Bible. <laughs> yep, it's the new Bible. Yeah. Absolutely. So so these men that we mentioned, Niemöller and Barth and Bonhoeffer, drafted what was called the Barman Declaration, and it essentially said the state must not and could not co-opt the church. And the, the sanctity and separation of the church from the state must be clear. Now, again, I we've mentioned on this podcast that um, really the pandemic brought about it heightened and exposed the ambiguity in the minds of, I think, many Christians and certainly pastors as to what is the clear role of the church and what is the clear role of the state. So when we had the government, at least in Indiana, telling us how to celebrate Easter and whether we could or could not take communion, whether we could or could not sing songs, um, whether we could meet on the church property or not, how far apart we had to be. Uh, I mean, we got into all kinds of ridiculousness and, and overreach in the name of public health, um, simply because the church really wasn't sure, like, what is our call and what's their call? What's our purview and what's their purview? In other words, where do the lines of authority cease and where where does the other one begin? And I think this is the issue. Because someone who might not be as engaged in churches, someone who is not a Christian, they might think, what's the big deal? Why is, why is the church making such a big deal about this public safety with pandemic coming? But what they don't see and what every American should see is it's not even the specific issue of whether you can meet or, or, or whether you should sing in church or not. I mean, those are important. Right. Don't get me wrong. It's the worldview. It's, it's what line are you drawing? What statement are you making? Because once you make a statement, it's very hard to draw that back. Oh, right? You bring out a good point. This is it's, the issue it, of it's not the nuances of the specifics of the issue. It's the question of authority. It's question of authority. Right. You're making a statement. It's a power move. It's, it's like a bully comes and punches you in the face. Okay, the, the punch hurts, sure, but he's making a statement saying, I'm the biggest dog. I, I, you gotta get, you're you always going to submit underneath me. If you don't punch him back at that moment, you are submitting to that authority. It's a statement. You gotta, people understand that in, in, you know, in, in the playgrounds, in the, in the streets, alleys. But it, for the church, I mean, we were unprepared for that. Absolutely. Right? Well, let's look at the marketplace, you know. And uh, and as you guys are are hearing this today, which is Thursday, Saturday, we've got a market share meeting here at the church. And yep. part of what we're trying to do is reestablish the authority and the boundaries even in the marketplace. In recent administrations, we've seen so much encroachment by the federal government into the private business sector. Yeah. The, the federal government should have very little influ, influence on the private markets. It should be, basically be making sure everybody's playing on this by the same set of rules yeah, and punishing true. fraud and right. all of those kinds of things. Right. Not actually giving out government tax subsidies and help, and and who's too big to well, fail and big not business, to fail. The government has, has oh, the, built a unholy alliance absolutely. and now they're pushing out the competition basically. And so what, what, what we're yeah. encouraging, and I get this is hard. I, we've been telling people from the pulpit, if they try to bring this back and you're a private business owner and they're trying to shut you down, resist. Yeah. Open your business. Uh, draw the line. I mean, th- th- this is what we're trying to say. If enough if enough business owners stood the ground, it would shut the system down. If enough pastors stood the ground, it would cause the federal government to come to a screeching halt. Um, and they would have to deal with the, the magnitude of what we're saying what was offensive to us, right? It was wrong. But when everybody plays it safe, and maybe that's a good place because we're running out of time. Oh, wow. <laughs> let, let, let's talk about, you know, so so the Barman Declaration, they're basically stating the obvious. Yeah. Stating the obvious, and they're asking pastors to sign on. And so what we found was, and historically, is that we had only 3,000 pastors uh, from the confessing church that signed this document. 
We had 3,000 members of the German church who were radically supporting Hitler. Mm -hmm. So we had both of those extremes. And then we had the mushy middle, which we still have the mushy middle. Yeah. 12,000 German pastors, most of whom would probably, at least theologically, right, side with the confessing church. But they took the path of least resistance. They basically said, hey, let's watch what happens to those 3,000 who signed the dotted line, right, stuck their neck out. Let's watch what happens and see how this thing plays out. Well, 3,000 wasn't enough to make a statement. You know, 15,000 would have been. Yeah. And so consequently, as soon as these 3,000 pastors stuck their neck out, there began to be systematic persecution. Now, it didn't come by carting these people immediately off to prison. It came through a series of laws that were passed to basically harass the church, force the church to break the law. So you pass, you pass a law that's, that's uh, bi from a biblical perspective, not a law at all. It, it's an overreach. It, it's, it's an attack law. It's a bait law. To, and then as soon as the church says, no, we're not going to do that. Oh, now you're disobeying the law. Now we have a pretense to arrest you. Yeah. Um, and so that's what happened. All these pastors started being persecuted, and their congregations started being persecuted, while 12,000 pastors sat there on the sideline and did nothing. And, um, and that's the problem. And it was the problem during the revolution. You know, you had those that signed the declaration, signed their own death warrant. Yeah. And it was a very small uh, minority that led to the revolution, which, which is good news again. God right. doesn't need a majority. Right. Right. He just needs a courageous band uh, of people that are deeply committed to the cause. And I guess we shouldn't be surprised or frustrated. We're in exactly the same situation now. This, this will probably be the situation until Jesus comes. You're never going to have a majority of Bible-believing Christians that will stick their necks out and have, and have either the clarity or the courage to see what needs to be done. Yeah. So we shouldn't be frustrated with that, I guess. That, and that's kind of where I landed was, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to try to win everybody over. Let me just find a committed group of, of men who, who see what's happening and are willing to stand against it. And, and, and let's die on that hill, yeah, right? That's good, yeah. Um, so let's close with this. I guess this is a good place. We, we, first of all, I encourage people to look up the Manhattan Declaration. Um, we don't have time. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll start off next time with the Manhattan Declaration. Um, but that was uh, Chuck Colson's national call to, for the church to rally around life. His version of the, of the, the, Barman, Declaration. the Barman Declaration to say, hey, he could see prophetically that the nation is going down a certain path. He's like, yeah. we need to draw a line in the sand and yeah. saying, we are not, we will not comply with these things. Okay. So, so yeah. this is the radical conclusion of the, of the Manhattan Declaration, yeah. Yeah. of which I signed and many other pastors signed. Because we honor justice and the common good, we will not comply with any edict that purports to compel our institutions to participate in abortions, embryo destructive research, assisted suicide and euthanasia, or any other anti-life act. Nor will we bend to any rule purporting to force us to bless immoral sexual partnerships, to treat them as marriages or the equivalent, or refrain from proclaiming the truth as we know it about morality and immorality, marriage and the family. We will fully and ungrudgingly render to Caesar what's Caesar's, but under no circumstances will we render to Caesar what is God's. Yeah, that's a strong statement. Yeah. It's a strong it's clear, statement, strong, but it's clear a clear statement, statement yeah. but it is biblical and it yeah. is simple. It's prophetic. It's, it's speaking from a higher authority. It's, not, it's saying we are not stewards of the state. I love it. And, <laughs> love and it. don't even yeah. try to get us to go yeah. along with yeah. this agenda if my, it violates Scripture. My allegiance not. is not to you. My ultimate allegiance is to the King of Kings. But, but, I love what, it. Yeah. But what Colson found was that all of his, you know, all of his popular authors, best-selling Christian authors, yeah. pastors of mega churches that he thought would jump on board to such a clear statement of non biblical non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. You would be surprised, and if you want to read the book, he, he I Metaxas mean, mentions names. We won't do it on our podcast today, but he mentions names of pastors that are household names today. 
Yeah. This could not sign this for some, as he called it, fussy theological hair splitting um, or wording or whatever. Uh, and the cause was so great. And yet we're sitting around being so nitpicky about things that at the end of the day don't ma- make a hill of beans. Yeah, he actually does mention it in his book because I guess Chuck Colson read Bonhoeffer by by Metaxas, yeah. and he wrote... He gave him a copy he, of the book. Yeah, and, and Chuck Colson wrote in the margins of the part of the Declaration about the, the parallels in Manhattan Declaration, and when Chuck Colson passed away, his widow gave the book to Metaxas, and Metaxas, going through the book, saw that, and he wrote the names in here. We're not going to mention it, but when I read it, I was like, wow. Yeah. Metaxas called people out. Well, well, yeah, and and Colson (laughs) was so disappointed because it's like, you got to be kidding me. Um, So here's, here's, and we'll end with this. Basically what what, uh, Metaxas says is, if the 12,000 pastors could have only seen the Holocaust that would shortly ensue, and and literally millions of lives, the blood that was shed for millions of people who were involved in in a world war just to stop this craziness— uh, all the l- slaughter that happened, uh, the the concentration camps. If those twelve thousand pastors would have actually gotten the game, could history been, have been different? Yeah. Um, and I, I think the answer to that question is, you know, absolutely. We don't know the full extent of that, but um, but but he asked the question like, what about today? You know, and what about pastors today? And so he he brings out a couple of interesting responses that are thoroughly unbiblical that, that I'd like to maybe start with next time as we're uh, getting into our chapter. But anyway, we really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. We're, we we are guilty of providing you with way too much reading, but I'm not going to apologize. Uh, some incredible books that you need to familiarize yourself with. In fact, uh, Erwin Lutzer has come out with a couple of books that deal with uh, this one's called When a Nation Forgets. It's got seven lessons we must learn from Nazi Germany. Uh, And he's got another book dealing also with the Nazi Holocaust that kind of dovetails with what we're talking about. The parallels are are too many to overlook. And we we hope that you're paying attention and that you're uh, being inspired to get engaged and to be a voice for righteousness uh, more than ever. So we look forward to being with you guys next Thursday. Until then, have an amazing week. 